We're on, we're on air. Baruchim Abayim, everyone. Um, I hope I'm not talking to myself and everyone can hear. Um, it's a bit weird uh, speaking online like that, but um, once again, welcome. Um, let's see if I can share um, a desktop. Let's try this. Okay. So um, <clears throat> we have a panel today, a men's fertility panel, with uh, Dr. Philip uh, Worthman, who's a uh, an, and a uh, urologist from the United States. Um, Mrs. Dori Novik, who's a Yoetzat Halacha, and myself, a rabbi in Machon Pua in Yerushalayim. Um, hopefully we will be able to uh, discuss two cases covering uh, a few issues to do with uh, <clears throat> with the uh, male fertility or fertility challenges on the male side. And as we will hear today, um, it never ends with the male fertility and uh, it has an impact on the whole entire family and the wife. Um, is Dr. Worthman with us? Can we really start? He, he's attempting to join. I think we'd better get started, and, and Dr. Worthman will be with us in a moment or two. Okay, so I guess we'll give it a uh, start. So the first case, we'll deal with a young couple, 28-year-old, married for three years. Um, the first two years, they've gone on birth control um and again the third year they've been trying a year has passed both are healthy she has normal cycles um but again a year and no pregnancy they've turned to every productive endocrinologist which is maybe in in, in parentheses i'll say that the uh, systems are slightly different in the united states and in israel um in israel it will be the gynecologist and fertility specialist who will do all the um, fertility aspects, both male and female, while in the United States, it will be divided into, um, into the reproductive endocrinologist who will do mainly the female part of things, and, um, and the urologist will be involved in the fertility aspect of men, uh, which is again, um, not the case in Israel. Nevertheless, they've seen a reproductive endocrinology, a fertility specialist, who sent both of them to have some uh, examines, examinations. The, the, uh, the first one is the, uh, the uh, blood work, the hormonal panel. Both male and female, husband and wife, have to undergo a, a, uh, a workup, a blood workup. And in our case, both came out normal and everything looks okay. The doctor sends the wife to have an ultrasound just to make sure that the ovaries look okay and it looks like she, she, uh, the ovarian activity is normal and she ovulates on a monthly basis. Um, <clears throat> and he sends the husband to have a sperm analysis, a spermogram. Um, <clears throat> since he's seen all kind of different methods of providing a, sper a sperm uh, a sample, he tells him that he has to provide a sperm sample through masturbation and masturbation only. Being a religious couple, they turn to their rabbis, and not surprisingly, they get more than one answer of what's the right thing to do. So one rav tells them it's an explicit mishnah in Masechet Yevamot, and the Gemara understands that as it discusses other options and Paskins clearly that that should be the case. And that's the what Shulchan Aruch holds. And the Paskim throughout all generations that it takes 10 years before you can assume there are fertility challenges or fertility problems. Um, and therefore, here also, since providing a sperm sample is a strict prohibition or may contain a strict prohibition, they should be waiting 10 years before they seek, at least before they turn to the um, um, providing a sperm sample. Another rabbi says that um, you can have 
um, you can have a sperm analysis done, but first we have to treat a, a fertility treatment for the wife. And that means she would take um, hormones which will enhance ovulation and we'll try to conceive in such a way, even if we have problems with the, um, with the sperm. Um, another rabbi they've seen decided that um, you can provide a, a uh, sperm analysis, but nevertheless, it has to be done through electro ejaculation under general anesthesia. And there's no other way to provide a sperm sample. One cannot provide a sample through masturbation. That is against the halakha, and that can't be done. And uh, again, so that's our case. Is is if is Dr. Worthman already with us or, or not yet? I think he's still having some technical difficulties. Technical difficulties. Okay. So you could probably continue. So we will continue. So um <clears throat> So I'll try to I'll try to explain both the the medical side of things, and uh, and the halachic side of things. And uh, Laurie, feel free to uh, intervene if you see if you want to say or add anything. Mm -hmm. So um, the truth is that on a on a medical uh, level, we do know that it should it can take time. It usually takes time to naturally conceive even a perfectly healthy fertile young couple um, which eventually will have or may have 15 children if they wish um, you don't always conceive on the first attempt in average we know again for a healthy young fertile couple it will take up to six months in average to conceive and up to 12 months is considered normal. So 90 to 95% of couples will conceive, of healthy couples will conceive within 12 months, which is why for a younger couple, the assumption is that if they haven't conceived within a year, that's when we should start testing. And up to a year, we should be a bit more patient because sometimes it just takes time to conceive. And, and again, probably everything is okay. We do know that stress and anxiety um, can interfere with, uh, with fertility. So again, so our role um, within the community is to help them understand that that's perfectly normal if a year has, hasn't yet passed and they're not yet uh, pregnant. Um, but again, after a year, medically, that's when we start uh, testing because we know that, as I said, 95% of couples will conceive um, within a year if they're, if they're fertile. And therefore, if there's no pregnancy, we have to assume that there's a fertility problem. Um, we should add about older couples and when right. we... When so maybe, right, so maybe this is the place to say that older couples, uh, we'll, add, we'll add that, that as we know, as the woman's age um, increases, the chances to conceive goes down. So when a woman hits 35, we know that there's a decrease in fertility. When she hits 40, it's a, it's a drastic uh, a drop in fertility. And statistically, um, of the average 45-year-old woman is infertile. So we want to really make sure that if it's a young couple, we have the patience of one year. But if it's an older couple, again, 35, pushing 35, that's when we would want to uh, start testing things even before a year has passed. Right. And also if the couple has, if either member of the couple has some kind of uh, history or, or reason to suspect there would, there would be a fertility issue, that would also be a reason to test earlier. That's, that's definitely true. But once again, in our case, the, uh, the assumption is both are fertile or both are healthy. There's no unknown, there's no known problem and uh and again the fact that the year had passed means that we have to start testing we know that about half of the cases of infertile couples so the problem will be with the wife and the other half will be with the husband so it's not unlike they used to believe in the olden days um uh, we know that infertility uh, affects both men and women pretty much equally um, right, and then also sometimes you have them both being affected. That's so, yeah. true. That's definitely true. But uh, 
And therefore, obviously, as we said, both have to be tested. So a blood work will let us know that hormonally they're both active, properly active. The ultrasound will show um, um, ovarian activity, normal ovarian activity, and 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 a uh, and the uh, the uh, ovulation. Also, and the structure will be you. You get some sense of the structure from the ultrasound as well. That's true, and uh, and uh, the sperm analysis will allow us to uh, to check the sperm. Um, what we look for in a sperm analysis is mainly three parameters. Um, the one, the first one is concentration. We want to make sure that there's enough concentration in the, in the uh, sperm sample, uh, which normally is around the 20 million sperm cell per square centimeter. That's what we would want. Uh, that will be considered normal. Um, that may have changed in some places. They consider 15 million as normal. We know that there's within the, the last uh, um, few decades, there's a decrease in the quality of, of, uh, of male uh, sperm count, and therefore the normal cutoff has dropped slightly from 20 to 15, according to some, uh, to some uh, ways of calculation. But nevertheless, that's more or less what we expect to be normal. In many cases, we'll find 100 million and 200 million and even more, um, and that's obviously normal. Um, but again, as long as it's uh, 15 or 20 and over, that will be in normal count. The second parameter we're looking for is the motility, or how many of the sperm cell are moving and how fast they are moving. In this case, we want to see about 40% um of uh, of motile sperm and and of that we want to see um about half of them which are rapidly moving um and again there's rapid movement there's medium movement there's slow movement and there's no movement and, uh, and there are various ways to try and and uh, analyze the uh, the quality but once again we want to see a fair amount of sperm which are which are motile um, lots of sperm, but if they don't move, wouldn't help us. Obviously, the sperm has to make the whole way um, through vagina, through cervix, up to the uh, the uh, fallopian tubes, and meeting the egg. And that's a long distance. They have to be motile and and uh, and healthy. The third parameter we have is the is the uh, morphology, and in in that that parameter is not quite clear um, how we define morphology. In, in this case, um, the, the, uh, the Kruger uh, criteria, we, we, uh, we, we're looking at 4% um, normal sperm cell morphology would be normal. Um, sometimes we see, again, even 10%, even 15% of normal sperm cell, but most of the sperm cell would not be in, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in a proper uh, normal shape. Most of them would have all kind of deformations, but if we have 4%, we know that's considered to be normal. So these are the three major parameters we want to see. There are a few more, but uh, again, these are the three major parameters we want to test for um, to see that there's proper concentration, proper motility, and proper, um, and proper morphology. That's what the sperm analysis gives us and in a very good way. Um, so again, so that will be the first testing of the of the sperm, and again, that will be in in brief the medical rationale behind and the um, and the reason for these tests. So if we turn to the halachic side of things, um, again, that's a a challenge. It's a challenge because we start off with um, air and onan. In Wait, I'm sorry, Rav Lewis, can we address the issue halachically about the timing of testing? Because we spoke about that medically, but we didn't touch on it halachically yet in terms of when a couple can start testing. When can they start testing? Right. It came up in the question, but we didn't get to it halachically yet. Testing for all both tests, male and female. Right. In other words, we had here in the in the test sample, there was a rabbi who said to wait 10 years before seeking any treatment and another rabbi who said they couldn't 
do the male treatment at all. So I think maybe if it's all right with you, maybe we should address that before we get into. Um, okay. The, so, 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 uh, right. So, so I don't know if any halachic authorities as of, uh, again, any written halachic authorities who wrote that there's a problem to have the wife tested before any period of time, any amount of time passing. Um, the, the, the Gemara discusses, or the Mishnah reader discusses, the, 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 the need for a husband to divorce his wife in order to be able to have children, because the mitzvah is to have children. And if his wife is barren and they have no children, so he has to divorce her and remarry or remarry someone else as a second wife. But, um, but that's, that's the issue of the, 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 uh, the Mishnah and Shulchan Aruch, because there was no real treatment in those days. Um, testing the, the wife and, and, and treating her um, does, doesn't really impose any halachic challenges. And therefore, um, I don't know of any halachic authorities who would prevent that being done the minute there's a reason or medical reason to do so. On a, an emotional side, uh, maybe you want to add uh, um, that part um, if we want to wait or start immediately. Um, well, well. so in, in terms of uh, it, one of the questions that's going to come up with, with all of this is that for a couple to begin to initiate the process of, of getting tested, uh, there's the medical aspect, there's the halachic aspect, which is, as Robert Lewis has begun to, to explain, is really more flexible than the number 10 years would seem to indicate, right? I mean, the Chazanish said after two years, and I think nowadays, uh, vast preponderance of halachic authorities are not telling couples that they have to wait, but beyond what medical authorities would tell them to do. But there's also really a, a very, it's a very challenging halachic bar to being, uh, not halachic, I'm sorry, emotional bar to being, to being tested. On the one hand, a couple might be very eager uh, to have children to conceive. And on the other hand, to be tested is to confront, uh, face on, very, very clearly the possibility or even uh, the eventuality that this is not going the way that it was planned to go. And it might not continue to go the way that it was planned to go. There's a lot of unknown. And suddenly there are a lot more people involved in this process than one, than one had thought. So that so that it's not just a question of well when does your doctor say you can you should be tested and when does your rabbi say you should be tested and of course you want to conceive so you're jumping to get tested even for couples who feel that way uh, that moment of making the contact with the physician of initiating tests is a very very charged and challenging moment uh, for the woman it can touch on her conception of herself as a woman, how much is her is her idea of womanhood rooted in her idea of being able to conceive? And the truth of the matter is that that's very much the case, as I think we'll detail more moving forward, that's very much the case for the man as well. So, you know, we talk about non-invasive tests, and that's uh, how Lewis started, talking about things like uh, blood tests and ultrasounds. And even those, uh, you can call them non-invasive, and uh, even non-invasive tests can have can have a real effect on the couple and be a real challenge to go through. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, definitely. Um, <clears throat> sometimes you're right. Sometimes the physicians or the doctors are focused on the numbers and organs, and uh, we should know that there are actually people behind. Um, we welcome Dr. Worthman. Thank you for joining us. Um, <clears throat> Thank you. It's been a bit of a challenge actually getting into the portal this morning, but I'm glad uh, glad we're able to work it out on the third browser try. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Um, so we, we've we've uh, reached the the halachic side of things. Maybe I'll I'll, I'll just uh, shortly um, discuss the halachic issues of providing a sperm sample, and then, doctor, if you have anything else to uh, to add to that, that will be uh, um, most appreciated. Um, so again, the the pr providing a sperm sample has a challenge, as we know in Sefer Bereshit, um, Hakadosh Baruch Hu, um, uh, um, uh, takes both Er and Onan for um, wasting their seed. And, uh, and the Shulchan Aruch, and famously the Ari, um, and a, a, a classic rabbinic uh, um, approach is that, that uh, wasting seed um, in, in vain is a serious halachic uh, a problem, and, and masturbating um, may even um, have a, 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 a Torah-obligated prohibition to it, 
according to some halachic authorities, the Vismak writes it's a it's a prohibition of Lotinaf, and Rav Moshe Feinstein follows that view as well. And therefore, that is a real challenge. As I mentioned, a challenge that um, even today you will hear Rabbanim who would say 10 years, as the Minchat Yitzchak writes, uh, Amber Moshe Feinstein writes five years, the Chazanish writes two years, as we heard before. Um, um, I, I can tell that at Pua, we, we would uh, uh, confine with the, with the medical approach that if it's a young couple who've been waiting for a year, that's a good enough reason to provide a sperm sample for two reasons. A, because we know that medically that's when it's needed. And if it's needed after one year, uh, if it's permitted after two years, it should be permitted after one year if we know that medically that's the case. And again, the Chazanish lived in a time not that far ago, but, uh, but they had known much less than what we know today. Um, so that's what we would recommend. And more so because halachically there are ways to provide a sample which uh, um, overcome the halachic challenge of providing a sperm sample. So uh, I'll, I'll just jump in here that also, uh, you know, that's also the position of uh, Nishmat's uh, Rabbanim, the fertility counselors that when couples come to us, if their doctors have advised them that it's time to pursue fertility testing, we're absolutely supportive of that. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I think that's a common understanding among most rabbis today and most authorities today. Um, I'll, I'll just but, point out only because in Dafiomi we just learned uh, this mission in Yevamos, but there also seems to be a machloket in the sense that they talk about being able to divorce because of infertility at three years or sometimes two and a half years. So it seems right. that 10 years, which is, uh, I believe, the time that came from Avraham and Sarah initially uh, before she took Hagar, um, also seems to be challenged in the Mishnah. Yeah, unfortunately, the Gemara there uh, concludes that clearly it's 10 years and nothing less. I mean, it's true that if not for the 10-year period, there are many couples who would divorce and have no children because, as we know, there are couples out there who will be married for four years or five years or seven years and eventually will conceive when the, the fertility uh, um, levels are uh, uh, challenging, but possible um but again thank god we're not living yes. at the times of avraham and hagar um we well, live longer to an extent at least and uh yeah so so as i mentioned the, the halachic concept that 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 leads us in these questions is 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 always ha what we call hakal hakal trila so if there's a, a a serious halachic prohibition and a light halachic prohibition, and we can transgress one of them to provide the same solution, obviously the resolution would always prefer the 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 one which is halachically less challenging. So providing a sperm sample for no good reason would be a a prohibition. But if we can do it in a way that challenges halacha in a minor way, that's what we would that's what we would uh, uh, um, uh, prefer. And the method that we've developed in, in Mahon Pua was to provide a sample through what we call a vaginal collection. So the couple will have normal relations, after which the wife would stand up and collect the, the uh, discharge into a sterile cup, the same cup a, cup a person would use for a um, urine test, a sterile urine test, um, which is available in most places pretty easily. Um, that will be then within an hour-ish, an hour and a half, taken to the sperm um, lab and, and tested. And we've um, researched and others have researched and the, re and the results that we get from such a, a, a sample are very similar to what we would get from providing a sample through masturbation. So even though it's not 100% accurate, only 94 to 93 percent to be precise according to the the uh the uh the paper that was uh that was shown um that gives us a a, a pretty clear understanding of what the the uh, situation with the sperm would be and halachically we have a very um um unchallenging way of providing a sperm sample because it comes through normal relations with the husband and wife so there's no question of zero levatalav of wasting sperm in vain um, and it's provided in a normal natural way which halakhically is is permissible 
and uh, normally there will be discharges and that's what we're collecting and that's perfectly okay there's no prohibition halakhically to stand after relations and and therefore this challenges the halakha in a very minor way that will be our first choice to provide a sperm sample if that sample is no good or if the couple for whatever reason can't provide a sample in such a way there are two other halachic ways to provide a sample the one would be and that's written in some of the of Moshe Feinstein's Chuvot and in other places um, is uh, um, uh, is what we call coitus interruptus which means the couple have relations and just before ejaculation the husband will come out and ejaculate into a sterile cup um, the advantage is that stimulation does not happen uh, um, through masturbation um, the disadvantage is that the, the ejaculation doesn't happen um, like normally happens through normal relations. Um, so that will be the second best um, um, option. However, we've seen that it's not so easy for, for, for all men to time uh, um, this procedure. We've seen all kind of mistakes happening because of this procedure. So we're not, you know, it's not the, uh, it's not really suitable for everyone. The third option, which exists, and there's you know, famously in the tshuva of uh, of Chaim Moiser, uh, the Achiezer, and in other places, is the option of using a sterile condom, um, mistakenly uh, um, called a halachic condom, which is something we don't like because people think that that can be a a, uh, a condom for for use used for birth control, which is not the case. Um, so a sterile condom which will be placed um, by the husband, have normal relations in such a way, and the sperm is collected with the, uh, the condom. The condom is then removed gently um, and, and sent to the, uh, the lab, um, and sent to the lab uh, um, for the analysis. Um, so these, these will be the, uh, the three methods that we have. As I mentioned, Hakala Kaltchila, and I think, uh, yeah, Laura, you want to comment on that? Yeah, so uh, so Nishmat's Beit Midrash, uh, Rabbi Ne Nishmat and the Fertility Councils of Nishmat uh, also studied this issue and, and reached slightly different conclusions in terms of what the options are for a couple. Um, what Rav Lewis says is, is definitely a very respected policy of Mahon Pua. Um, the policy that our Rabbanim developed is a little different, and it's that basically there are two options uh, that the couple can choose from and that that's uh, very much up to the couple. The first is, as mentioned, the option of uh, collection via relations with a sterile condom. Um, the second option would be collection through manual stimulation um, by the man. Uh, the preference if pursuing manual stimulation would be either for his wife to stimulate him, assuming they're not need, she's not Anita, or for him to use a non-dominant hand or a gloved hand to somehow Again, this similar, a similar idea of removing it from a classic or from, let's say, what uh, perhaps from what Rav Moshe in a big chidush uh, called the uh, niuf, um, referred to as, as uh, his reference uh, in uh, defining uh, what it meant for, for a man to, uh, to uh, collect his, sperm, his semen by himself. Um, and these, these two options um, are abundant present as up to a couple to choose from. Uh, where the choice of the options um, very much depends on some specifics of the couple. So for example, one big question that comes up, it's a big question in terms of the emotional uh, weight of this is, does the woman want to participate in this process? It's actually not a simple question. Um, a woman engaging in an act of sexual relations with her husband for the purpose of his semen being tested um, might be very might feel very uh, happy to be able to have an opportunity to, as Rev. Lewis suggested, make things as normal as possible, even in the process of testing, and participate as much as possible in helping her husband through it. But a woman might also feel uncomfortable that it's a very technical thing. It's not really, uh, it's not really what what the couple seeks to do, generally speaking, when they have relations, and that might be that might be complicated for her. Um, there are also questions to ask in terms of how the man is perceiving. Um, what's happening for a man, especially men who are raised in the Dati or the Dati, the old Dati world, um, the the concept of uh, collecting semen through manual stimulation is 
is shocking. It's rife, you know, there's a years and years of education to a man about restraint, about how he's how he's touching himself and relating to his own body. And the idea that suddenly uh, in a moment uh, he's shifting gears can be extremely, extremely difficult for him. Um, that's also certainly a, a big consideration in weighing the different options and why some couples would strongly prefer an option that involves a woman, whether, as our rabbis suggest, uh, the possibility of the woman helping him with manual stimulation or as is widely uh, discussed and Rav Lewis uh, suggested, and our rabbis as well, uh, the possibility of uh, relations with a, with a sterile con condom. Uh, another factor that comes into play is the religious, uh, the religious perspective of the couple. Um, how, how are they, how are they looking at the situation that they're in? How are they perceiving the process? Is this process one that they want to be as close as possible to the regular course of relations between them? Or is it something that they see as more medical process? Um, there also might be a sense in which, and this is also complicated, a lot of the fertility testing, as well as a lot of the fer fertility uh, procedures are going to be very heavily weighted on the woman. Um, there's an interesting question about how this process as well really balances it out. So th these questions, these questions are very, very complicated and very challenging. I see, is, doc is Dr. Worthman trying to speak? Um, okay, it's, it's not, it's not clear. Um, Dr. Worthman, I hope that, uh, I hope that we'll hear from you, uh, from you in a moment. So those are different perspectives. One thing to add, which is of course, something to take into account with these, with these options is of course the, the aspect of NIDA. Um, when a couple, when when a woman is in NIDA, it limits the couple's options in terms of uh, of what can be done. Um, okay. Um, for, from my standpoint, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be a hundred percent accurate in terms of the semen analysis. Ninety ninety five percent gives us quite a a good idea of what's going on because, truthfully, semen analyses aren't that accurate. They're done by human beings. There's incredible variation from day to day, week to week, specimen to specimen, which is why we always try to get more than one sample if there's anything that's wrong. A good sample is a good sample. Um, and no reason to put the couple, I think, through more than one if everything looks okay. But when there's a sample that presents challenges, at least from the medical perspective, we would like to at some point see a second sample because of the uh, normal physiologic variation and the other issues that goes on, that go on externally uh, to a man, to a man that may affect the quality of his uh, his sperm, um, but I think any of those collection uh, methods that both of you mentioned would be perfectly fine from the medical standpoint. Okay. I think, I mean, there's a lot, much more to say, but maybe um, we should move into the second case. In, in, can I go back and ask both uh, of you a question? So something recently came up sure. in my practice and uh, it was uh, it was a first. And the first was that um, a rabbi of a young couple who is off continent uh, in America, uh, actually told them that they have to have a shomer watch the sample for testing. Now, we've always done that for the use of the sample, but I've never heard that be um, suggested where someone would come into the lab where we're just going to actually test the sperm. I I is this some very machmir type opinion or is this um, something that, uh, that may become a standard? So I think this is another area um, where, um, where where Nishma. I, I don't know. I don't. I don't. I mean, Rav Lewis can speak to Rav, to Pua's uh, thoughts about about this particular question. I'll just say, though, in general, uh, Nishmat's Beit Midrash, um, though it certainly uh, supports uh, couples using halachic supervision for any stage of the fertility process, does not require it um, in cases where it's where there's a strong reason to be confident that there are enough safeguards uh, in place medically. So that's it's a it's it's a bit of a different pr approach. I know that Pua, for the certainly for the uh, for the IVF process, is very very strongly advocates uh, using doing doing going through the process only through supervision. Is that correct, Rivalis? That is correct, right? Um, but what you're presenting, Rabbi uh, Dr. Worthman, is interesting because 
Um, there are two reasons why one would want supervision. The one is because we don't trust the doctors or the labs, and we, they're always uh, suspected to uh, abuse the uh, genetic material that we place in their hands. The second reason to have supervision is because, unfortunately, we're human, and as humans, we err, and we make mistakes, and, and the supervision is there to prevent mistakes. So the view Mahon Pua has and the view, um, um, uh, I think, well, definitely most halachic authorities today, is that we have to trust the, the medical personnel. And if you don't trust the labs you're going to, so don't go there at all. It's not that we don't trust them. It's just we know that mistakes happen. And to prevent mistakes, that's where the supervision uh, um, is. But if one does not trust the medical system or the medical lab, and he's concerned that they would abuse or misuse the uh, the genetic material. In that case, they would want any genetic material that uh, that reaches the labs to be supervised because maybe they'll steal it and sell it to I don't know where and use it for I don't know what. And therefore, any um, any um, 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 case of providing a sample even for testing should be supervised. I don't know of of anyone who demands that. Well, I, I'm, I'm, it's a new it's a new one for me as well. It's the first time I hear that there's a rabbi who, who demands um, supervision for sperm analysis. I don't know who's the authority who's behind that, but it will be based on the fact that we don't trust doctors, which I personally believe a is the wrong attitude, and b is very troubling because I mean if you don't trust the doctors and the labs, um, so they'll manage to trick any supervision you put there. The supervisor can't uh, um, uh, be e everywhere all the time. And if they want to steal a sperm sample, they'll do it with or without a, 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 a shomer, a, a supervisor. Um, so I'm, I'm, again, I'm surprised that that really happened, but uh, we definitely don't think that's needed. Thank you both for that, for that comprehensive answer. Thank you. Okay, so with no f further ado, um, we'll go to case. With Dr. Worthman, maybe you want to present the case and, and, and discuss the medical sides of things, and we'll take it away from there. So one of the uh, most troubling uh, situations that we encounter, certainly distressing for the couple, is when you have a normal, healthy, young man and he does a, a seam analysis at the appropriate time under the appropriate guidance, and we find that there is no sperm. And uh, certainly, um, and you can both, both speak about the, the, the emotional shock and, and, and devastation uh, when someone finds this out and what goes through both a man's you know, brain, a mind, and also his, his kala, um, and of course, then the next thing we want to do is recheck another sample. But for this case, and, and sometimes we're lucky enough that someone will have nothing on one and then they'll have some on another. Um, and it changes, obviously, the prognosis and what needs to be done. But for this case, we're going to say that the patient had two samples and both samples showed up with no sperm. The samples were prepared appropriately. Typically, when we see no sperm on a drop of, of a seminal fluid, uh, we'll put that sample in a centrifuge and we'll spin it down. And the reason is, is that some men make very, very small amounts of sperm that will escape from the testicle and get out into the fluid. But if you look for five minutes at one little drop, which is how a semen analysis is initially conducted, then you may not find anything. And the idea is in the centrifuge machine, all the cells, the sperm cells, as few as they are, will come to the very, very bottom of the uh, tube that the specimen is put in. And then you can decant off all the other liquid. And then in the one little drop at the very bottom, you hopefully will have all the cells in, in the whole sample. And it makes it easier to find sperm uh, if someone has sperm. And this is a very important uh, technique that is many times overlooked by many labs, especially when a couple goes to a regular general lab that doesn't specialize in performing fertility. There are other labs, at least I know here in California, that will report a result less than 2 million. 
So less than 2 million doesn't really have a lot of meaning because is it zero? Is it 1 million? Um, so, so it's really important and I can't stress it enough that if your patient is going to go through the extra rigors of having to collect samples based on the halachic permissibility that once they actually get that sample that it goes to a lab that knows what it's doing because it it makes or can make all the difference in the world to a given couple so i'll just start with that so now we get past this and the samples that were centrifuge also show no sperm so we then go and we take the, the man's history and we find that he's a normal normal gentleman who's 20 something and there's nothing in his history um, we do a physical exam, which will be the next step. And in this patient, the testicles are pretty normal in size, but he has bilateral varicose seals or varicose veins that um, uh, drain the testicle, which is a very common cause of infertility. And I, I threw that in here because there are some issues in terms of treatment in a man who's got azospermia, but also may have a correctable cause of that azospermia. And I wanted to throw that into the conversation uh, as opposed to just taking a straightaway case. And so this gentleman has some varicose veins. We then, the next step would be to do blood work. And it shows that um, his FSH, the hormone from his brain that tells the testicles to produce sperm is elevated. And what that means is that the brain is functioning, nor functioning normally, but the testicles are having difficulty. And it tells us there's a problem with sperm production. The one thing the FSH does not tell us on almost any instance is whether the patient has any sperm production going on inside the testicle. This is basically a marker. It's not a, a, an absolute tool to use to understand whether a patient has sperm or not. It just says the patient has a sperm production issue. And we also measure a testosterone level and his was borderline low. The next set of, genetic, uh, of blood tests would be genetic testing looking at the patient's chromosomes and looking at specifically genes that control sperm production that are on the Y chromosome. And we know that abnormalities in both of these type of genetic tests can lead to azospermia and significant male infertility. And they also can be predictive as to what the chances are that the gentleman is producing any sort of sperm within his testicle um, and can give us some predictive odds as to when we start going ahead and treating uh, the patient. And then just to round it out, uh, that the patient's wife is 21 and otherwise normal. There is no female fertility issue here. This is purely a case of male uh, infertility with no sperm present in the ejaculate. It's because of a production problem and the patient has a potentially correctable cause of that. So as a next step, would it make more sense for me to run through the treatment options or for the both of you to comment at this point on the halachic implications of a man who has no sperm and what halachically the preferences would be to treat as a first or second step? I think you should start by I running through the best if you just... Okay. Yeah, go through the so, options and, uh, yeah. We know that in men who have non-obstructive azospermia, which is the condition um, that this is called uh, in the medical world, which means that there is no sperm in the ejaculate, but it is not a blockage. So we know in, in, in men under these circumstances that probably between 60 to 70% of those men will have a small amount of sperm being produced inside the testicle. And there are operations that have been designed, uh, the best one from the standpoint of being able to retrieve sperm is something called a microsurgical testicular sperm extraction. And what this operation does is it uses a microscope such that we're able to open the cover of the testicle and look at the inside of the testicle so the testicle, we need to know a little bit about testicular anatomy and physiology to understand the operation and the treatment. So the testicle is, uh, I give an example, it's, it's almost analogous to a baseball. Um, it's got a white outer covering, it's got red blood vessels that look like laces. And when you open up the cover, which is thick and tough, kind of like uh, the leather casing on a ball, 
it's basically a ball of twine, uh, which is what a baseball is. And the medical term for, for, for that inside the test is called the seminiferous tubules. And I hope I'm not being too rudimentary, but I just, I, I don't know who the exact audience is and I wanna make sure that everybody can understand with the analogy. So the seminiferous tubules are akin to twine. They're basically tubules that are just all coiled up inside the testicle. They are microscopic, meaning they're not individually visible to the naked eye. They're only visible on 10 to 15 power magnification. And inside the walls of these tubules uh, are where the sperm are produced. And the, the tubules are hollow. The sperm move from the outside of the wall down into the hollow channel and then they're able to exit um, and collect in the epididymis. So what we've learned in terms of testicular physiology is, now that we know a little bit about the anatomy, that many men, the majority, will have some amounts of sperm production go on within these tubules. In a normal testicle, every tubule is making sperm. So if I were to go and I was to sample any part or any tubule in, in, in a testicle of, of someone who had normal sperm production, I'm going to find some sperm. It's uniform. It's homogeneous. In the patient who has non-obstructive vasospermia, the sperm production may be heterogeneous, meaning that there may be little pockets of sperm production that go on. All the tubules are not alike. And so the challenge is to try to identify the tubules that make sperm versus the tubules that don't. And the reason is, is that we're not taking out all the tubules and destroying somebody's testicle in order to get a few sperm to use for IVF. So we have to be very, very uh, pinpoint precise because there is a balance between being helpful to the patient and also doing permanent damage to the patient's testicle in future. And I've designed a technique that, that addresses this, but that might be outside the scope of, of, of this conversation. So the idea is ask, that, well, uh, uh, I'm sorry? Maybe one should add that this can destroy the production of hormonal, important hormonal uh, activity in the, uh, in the testes. And that's important. It's not only fertility, which is a uh, uh, compromise, but uh, the hormonal production as well. Absolutely. And that's, that's exactly why We've designed an operation that limits the destruction uh, while we allow maximal ability to harvest sperm. So th this procedure online has gotten a bad rap in that there are doctors who do it in a very, very aggressive fashion. And really will tell patients, I expect that you know we're gonna damage the testicle. I will tell you from my experience that is not needed. Um, and again, we kind of digress from, from uh, the case, but there shouldn't be, when this is done appropriately, an issue where someone who has a normal testosterone will have his testosterone drop to very low levels if the procedure is done in a very methodologic and careful way and not in an aggressive way. But in any event, the idea is by using the microscope, we have something that discerns areas that may produce sperm from areas that don't. So we don't take random pieces out. We try to very carefully select the tubules that look best under the microscope. We remove a small amount of those tubules. We put them in a Petri dish. We open them up. And then we go to the IVF lab and we look and we see if there's sperm. And then we can go and sample multiple different areas. Again, making sure that we're not damaging the blood supply of the testicle, that we're not, you know, this operation has been described. It's almost if you looked at what people post online, it, it, it's almost like medieval torture, but it doesn't have to be done this way. Uh, and I use another very basic analogy. There's a, a mosquito on my wall and I can kill it with a, mis a fly swatter or I can use a howitzer. Uh, either way, the mosquito is dead, but in one way I blow up the wall. So the idea is we can get sperm out without blowing up the testicle and without causing damage uh, in a very significant way that Rob Lewis, uh, you know, very importantly pointed out, uh, and this is an issue not only for patients, but for the doctors who are doing it, to really use um, minimally invasive, minimally damaging techniques to get uh, essentially similar results. And, and, and again, I've, I've written on this, but so option number one would be to go look for sperm with a 60 to 70% chance of finding sperm by using this testicular sperm extraction. And then those sperm would need to be used for in vitro fertilization and the timing of the procedure can be done in synchronization with a woman's IVF cycle the day before or the day of the egg retrieval and we get the sperm fresh or 
it can be done in advance and those sperm frozen. Uh, there are some potential issues with freezing sperm, although the statistics show that using frozen versus fresh sperm for this situation gives the same uh, pregnancy rate. I certainly see a couple of couples a year where we find very few sperm or the sperm of marginal quality and maybe it would have been better to put them in the eggs. But there are also issues with cycling a woman for IVF when you don't know if you're going to get sperm or what the backup plan uh, to that may be. And then I'm just going to move over a little bit to the other potential treatment option, which is to repair the varicose veins, which is a much different type of surgery. We don't actually touch or see the testicle or open the testicle. We uh, do this procedure in the groin uh, area and we uh, block off the veins that are causing the problem. And in 30 to 50% of men who have varicose veins, especially if they're reasonably sizable, although that's not always the case, um, that they need to be, uh, in any event, uh, in 30 to 50% of those men within a year, they may have a small amount of sperm production whereby it's coming out in the ejaculate those sperm may be used for IVF without having to go back and access the testicle, which uh, our halakhic experts are gonna, I'm sure, tell you more about uh, the considerations in, in, in that procedure. Um, and in a small number of cases, probably 10% uh, of those that have sperm, they can achieve pregnancy naturally, um, and probably a little bit larger may have enough sperm that an insemination uh, would be able to be considered as opposed to an in vitro cycle. So from the medical standpoint, I try to educate the patients as to what their options are. And look, around the country, around the world, I'm sure there are very, very different um, ideas. Some people will say go directly to in vitro because 60 to 70 percent of finding sperm, chance of finding sperm now uh, is more beneficial for the couple. And then other would say, hey, you know what? Let's, let's try to do the other procedure and give it time. Uh, also, I guess, depends on the age of the couple and, and what they want to do. But now I'm going to leave it in your very capable hands time, uh, to, uh, to talk about. And, uh, try and, uh, and uh, uh, see maybe a few other issues. So maybe, uh, maybe Lori, you want to comment on uh, what Dr. Worthman mentioned? Um, should I comment on the halacha or on emotional uh, aspects? Yeah, halacha, yeah, whatever. I mean, whatever you think is. I mean, is I'm assuming you'll hear most of the halacha. On the whole, you know, if, if we have if we have alternatives that aren't going to potentially involve, uh, you know, damage to the male organ, we, we tend to prefer them. For I'm sure Rav Lewis is going to go into more detail about that. That doesn't mean that that's uh, necessarily completely off the table, and it's uh, it's complicated. Um, but uh, in terms of the in terms of the uh, the kind of emotional weight uh, on the couple, uh, here here we have this this situation where uh, the man is going to go through a procedure. So first of all, the man's had whatever uh, the, the man is confronted the fact that uh, he's as a fertility issue. If we talked about uh, things that challenge a man's sense of his own virility or masculinity to start with, the idea that he doesn't have uh, sperm is. Uh, as, as a specific issue is, uh, you know, shoots that way up in terms of the sensitivity here. Um, and uh, additionally, we have we have this kind of interesting thing, which is that uh, the man might be very hesitant and reluctant about a procedure even once it's permitted. Um, again, for, for a mix of reasons, including emotional reasons about the procedure. And, um, and at the same time, there's this complexity for the woman, which is, well, I, I was going through all these tests or, you know, even when you go through this procedure, I'm going to be going through uh, uh, my own my own set of procedures uh, because on some level, because of a, of a medical issue that's that's not even my own. So whenever you have fertility on one that's firmly established on one side and on another, there's a, there's a complexity for the couple to find a way to be mutually supportive and make sure that they're going through the situation together. Here, there's there's this whole other complicated aspect of uh, what, what might seem like a natural thing that a lot of fertility treatments would involve the man, but in reality actually doesn't happen in many of the cases. And there's a way in which that can that could be seen as balancing things out, but there's a way in which it, it can actually just add a tremendous amount of emotional intensity for the couple as they navigate this. And and that has to be taken into account. In particular, men need support as well as they're going through these processes. And that's something, you know, there are different support groups, there are different people to reach out to, as well as Rabunim, of course, like those Um, and, uh, and that's also a very, very significant aspect of how a couple's going to be able to navigate this. All right, I'll turn to Rav Lewis, so you can go into more detail about the halacha Rav Lewis. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, so what, what I'm... We don't really have too much time to go into all the issues. There's an interesting question of of Pitsula Daka. 
So there's some uh, uh, medical procedures done on on testicles, which may uh, cause the man a prohibition to remain married, um, which is not really the case in in, in the uh, testy or microtessy micro uh, um, procedure. Um, the, the main issue which I would uh, discuss here, as Laurie uh, mentioned, is is less the halachic side of things, but if it's a young couple who can undergo a procedure without causing damage, and in any case, any any uh, uh, um, um, operation on the testicle would cause damage, minor damage or or large damage, but it will definitely damage um, the the uh, testis to an extent. Um, better to 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 try the the uh, the uh, the procedures which are which are not going to damage the testicle. The the varicocele veins can be treated um, um, in in a very simple operation, or sometimes even with uh, without any operation, and that may give us a good result if we manage to provide a sperm sample or a sperm cell through uh, um, other procedures, that's what we would always prefer. If there's no other way, and we can't, either we have no time, and we try to want to get the best result within the shortest time possible, or that did not work, because as uh, Dr. Wolfman, you mentioned, that only helps within about 50% max of cases. Um, therefore, we would have to go to the, uh, the, uh, the operation and, and the uh, surgical solution. And hopefully we will find um, we will sp find sperm over there. Um, obviously, the next stage what we won't open today will be what if we don't find? Um, what will be the next solution? Is it using donor sperm, or is that is that not an option? And that's again a whole new uh, 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 ball game. But uh, but in terms of the the uh, the treatment that uh, that is done in such cases. The operation and the uh, surgical solutions are, are very helpful, and and thank God we live in a generation that um, very very few couples won't be able to conceive and have children of their own, um, because again thank God the the medical world and research have put in a situation in a stage where we can find even one sperm cell and turn that into a healthy child. And uh, and again, thanks to medicine and people like Dr. Berthman, um, that's that's available for everyone. Um, I'd like to stay with the time limits that we've uh, we've designated, um, which therefore I think will end um, more or less here. If there are any crucial questions that have to be asked, I don't know even if I can. I don't know if I know how to look for questions. Um, I don't see any in the chat. But if right there now. are important questions, we don't see in the chat. So that means that everything everything was perfectly understood, and everyone is uh, satisfied. So uh, thank you, Laurie. Thank you, Dr. Worthman. Thank you for the audience, and mainly thank you for Nishmat for organizing such an amazing event, uh, uh, knowledgeable and uh, and important. And uh, please God, this will only grow from strength to strength. Amen. Thank, thank you, you very much. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Take care.